So uh, good evening, friends. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Steve Adler to give today's OSMO 23 lecture. Steve has had a very distinguished career behind him. He obtained his AB degree from Harvard University and his PhD from Princeton University in 1964. Steve became a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in 1966, becoming a full professor of theoretical physics in 1969 and was named the New Jersey Albert Einstein Professor at the Institute in 1979. He was subsequently elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, Steve has been awarded the J.J. Sakurai Prize from the American Physical Society and the Dirac Medal of the International Center for Theoretical Physics, amongst other awards. Steve's seminal papers on high energy neutrino processes, current algebra, soft pion theorems, some rules, and perturbation theory anomalies helped lay the foundations for the current standard model of elementary particle physics. In more recent years, Steve shifted his attention to the foundations of quantum theory and developed the theory of trace dynamics from which quantum field theory is derived as an emergent approximation. Along with, he also made pioneering contributions to studies of objective collapse models. To my own understanding, trace dynamics is the dynamics of the future, which one day will replace uh, quantum field theory and uh, objective collapse models. Over to you, Steve. Trace dynamics and implications for my work of the last two decades. Okay, thank you, Tejinder. Thank you for inviting me in for the introduction. So what I want to do is to give an overview of trace dynamics and then briefly discuss connections to my recent projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, that's it. So overview of trace dynamics. Trace dynamics is a non-commutative generalization of classical Lagrangian and Hamiltonian dynamics. And I'll show how it works here in the Bazana case. Let the set of Q sub R's be non-commuting coordinates. In other words, they could be operators on some underlying complex Hilbert space or even some quaternionic Hilbert space. Although in my book, I focus on the complex case. And Q dot R's are, are their time derivatives. The dot just means partial with respect to T. And we form, if you form a Lagrangian of the Q R's and the Q dot R's, the ordering is important because these are non-commutative. So dl by dqr is not defined. But the idea here is to assume that everything is trace class so that there's cyclic invariance under the trace. And we define a trace Lagrangian L with a wiggly underliner, L boldface. L boldface is trace of the Lagrangian. Next slide, please. And now if you take the variation of the trace Lagrangian, and reorder cyclically so that all variations of QR and variations of Q dot R stand on the right, you can define derivatives of the trace Lagrangian with respect to QR and the trace Lagrangian with respect to Q dot R by the following formula. The variation of L is the trace of the sum over all degrees of freedom R, the L by dQR times delta QR plus the L by delta q dot r times delta q dot r. And this is the definition of the L by the qr and the L by the q dot r, where L is the boldface, L is the trace Lagrangian. And it's now easy to show that a lot of the properties of classical Lagrangian and Hamiltonian dynamics carry over to this framework. So for example, requiring that the action be stationary, zero is variation S, is variation integral dt of L, that implies the Euler-Lagrange equation, the trace Lagrangian by dQr minus d by dt dl by dq dot r is zero. And these are now operator equations. So this directly gives operator Euler-Lagrange equations. There's no need for a canonical quantization here. And my own view is that canonical quantization is basically an algorithm for inverting the classical limit of quantum mechanics and shouldn't play a role in the fundamental theory. So this gives a dynamics that's more general than quantum mechanics. 
Uh, next slide, please. To recover, recover quantum mechanics, we consider the equilibrium statistical mechanics of this dynamics. Now, have we skipped one? Let me see. Do I want to go back? Yeah, okay, go on now to four. Let's go to four. Okay, to recover quantum mechanics, we consider the equilibrium statistical mechanics of this dynamics. And that's based on noting that there are three generic, generic conserved quantities. First, the trace Hamiltonian. This is again, a straight analog of classical mechanics. We define P sub R as the L by dQr, where again, is the boldface L by dQ dot R. PR is the boldface L by dQ dot R. And the trace Hamiltonian is the trace of the sum over R of P sub R Q dot R minus the trace Lagrangian. Then a straight analog of the derivation of Hamilton's equations in classical mechanics shows that the H trace H or boldface H by dQr is minus P dot R and the boldface H by dPr is Q dot R. And from that, the H boldface H by dT is the trace of, by the definition, the H by dQr Q dot R plus the H by dPr P dot R. And now when you substitute these definitions for the H by dQr and the H by dPr, you get minus p dot r q dot r plus q dot r p dot r. And since it's trace class, you can cyclically permute out of the trace and you get zero. So the trace Hamiltonian is a generic conserved quantity, even in the presence of these operator uh, coordinates, coordinate time derivatives and canonical momenta. Okay, next slide, please. Now, the interesting thing also is that there's an operator I call this C tilde, which in the Bazana case is the sum over R of the commutators of the QR with the corresponding PR. And it's anti self adjoint. In the original form, this was discovered by my student Andrew Millard, and then it's gone through by me and with other collab various collaborators, successive generalizations. Uh, when fermions are included, it turns out the corresponding conserved quantity is sum over the bosons of the commutators minus the sum over the fermions of the anti-commutators. And you can begin to see that this looks somewhat like the canonical commutation relations of quantum field theory. If H, if the trace H is global unitary invariant, that is if it involves no non-commutative constants, then in fact, C tilde, this was in a, a paper with Akin Kempf, C tilde is the corresponding Noether charge operator, the C tilde uh, by dt is zero. So C tilde is conserved, and therefore it can appear in the canonical ensemble. And it's a rather general property as long as the original trace Lagrangian or trace Hamiltonian are global unitary invariant. Finally, and this is a bit more technical, the phase space measure defined as the basically product over everything that's real valued in sight of the matrix elements of Qs and Ps and their components A, the real compo components. In other words, you write, if it's in a complex space, you write Q is Q real plus IQ imaginary. If it's in a quaternionic space, it's the four components. That's invariant under canonical transformations in general. And Therefore, it's an invariant in particular under the Hamiltonian time evolution. So there's a generalized Muville's theorem, and that means you can use statistical mechanics. See, statistical mechanics only works when one volume of phase space moves dynamically into the same volume. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. Now I'll drink a bit of water. So now we can form a canonical ensemble rho as z inverse, where z is the partition function, exponential of minus tau times a trace Hamiltonian minus the trace of a, of a Lagrange multiplier times c tilde. Now requiring this to have unit integral over phase space says that the partition function z is just integral d mu of e to the minus tau h minus trace lambda tilde c tilde. So tau and lambda tilde are ensemble parameters. The average of c tilde is 
can be written as I effective times a diagonal matrix where I effective squared, this is just a general statement for anything as a self adjoint. I effective squared is minus one, I effective adjoint is minus I effective, and I effective commutes with D. And the simplest case that I'll assume is that D is a multiple of the unit matrix. So D is H bar times one, and that's how an effective Planck's constant comes into this. C tilde average then is a function of tau and lambda tilde. So we can write lambda tilde as I effective times uh, lambda. Okay, let's go on to the next slide where lambda now again is real value. No, it's important, and this is something I missed when I first started working on this, and for a long time was hung up on how to get quantum field theory back, because I was averaging over everything. But because of the global unitary invariance, you have to do unitary fixing. So that's right. Now, lambda tilde is I effective lambda. That implies that rho is invariant under any U effective for which U effective adjoint I effective U effective reproduces I effective. And that's true because trace lambda tilde C tilde is trace lambda tilde U effective dagger C tilde U effective. Now you use the cyclic invariance again, and you use the fact that U's effectives commutes with lambda tilde be, to get the, the same quantity back. So that means that the canonical ensemble only partially breaks the global unitary invariance. So we will average too much if we use integral over the full phase space of the partition function so of the of row of the uh, canonical ensemble. So let's d mu prime be d mu with the overall u effective frozen with one global unitary invariance frozen. And then this restricted measure will be used to form thermodynamic ensembles, thermodynamic averages. And in my book, I'll put now, this is the book, the Cambridge 2004 book, where there's a full exposition of trace dynamics. And there's a discussion there that was worked out with Larry Horwitz of uh, analogs of BRST and so forth for trace dynamics and for this <laughs> global unitary Okay, let me now define an effective complex part. Let X be any <clears throat> QR or PR. Let's define X effective. You have to raise this a bit now. Uh, have, 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 can you raise the slide a bit? Can, oh, can, the, can you raise that a little bit? Uh, uh, oh, does this no, not go to the next oh, one? Oh, oh, I'll, 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 I'll make okay, it let's go back. Let's define X effective as a half X minus I effective, X I effective is the part of X that commutes with I effective. So if, uh, the next line just says that I effective, X effective is the same as X effective, I effective, because you get I effective X, if you multiply from the left, plus X I effective, and that's symmetrical. So you get the same thing if you multiply X effective by I effective from the left or the right. Okay, next slide. Now, physical observable are traces which are independent of the unitary fixing. So it's trace O is the same as trace U effective adjoint O U effective. And this suffices since transition probabilities can be written as traces. For example, the magnitude of alpha O beta squared, which is alpha O beta times beta O dagger alpha, is the same as trace of P alpha O P beta O dagger where P alpha is uh, a projection operator that can be written as a, uh, a Cauchy integral, one over two pi I, the integral of DC, one over Z minus O alpha. So therefore you can get any uh, transition probability from a unitary fixed uh, operator. Okay, therefore non-trace quantities are unitary fixing dependent. So we will only focus on trace quantities, which are unitary fixing independent. All right, next slide, please. Now, the idea for how quantum field theory emerges is to make a correspondence between the restricted phase space averages 
of the canonical ensemble rho times effective x1 through xn, where these are q effectives or p effectives as defined in the last slide, with operators in the quantum field theory where the role of i is played by i effective. And one can then derive equipartition theorems or ward identities for these averages. But there are approximations, and the approximations are conjectured in my book. Uh, Cambridge put them into fine print, in fact, and, and they are sort of true fine print because there aren't proofs of them yet. It's like fine print in a contract, okay, all the stuff that's hidden that you have to read. <laughs> so, first, there's an assumption that Tau, which is one over a mass in dimension, perhaps the Planck mass is very small. So that the terms in the canonical on in the uh, equal partition identities involving Tau and multiplying the trace Hamiltonian H drop out. There's a decoupling from the trace Hamiltonian. And secondly, that you can replace C tilde by its average value, I effective H bar. And these word identities then had the structure of quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. The commutator of the QR effective P S effective is I H slash delta R S plus order Tau. QR effective is QS effective is zero. And X dot effective is I effective over H bar commutator H effective with X effective plus order Tau. So you get a Heisenberg equation of motion. So these all come from a generalized word identity or in the form of a generalized equipartition theorem in trace dynamics. So the picture here is that locality as built in the quantum field theory is only an average property. The underlying quantum theory, field theory, there's an underlying dynamics where everything is totally non-local. And we know that there are non-local elements which come in things like the uh, einstein podolsky rosen paper and many other things with uh, entanglement. Here, everything is non-local and you get the restriction of the non-local non-commutativity to the Heisenberg algebra only when you're thermodynamically average. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> and here's a sketch of the general word identity derivation. You start with the, an average over the restricted phase space and then you take various choices of what you're averaging. If you take the anti-commutator of C tilde with I effective times W and use integral D mu prime of a total variation of zero, that's just translation of variance of the measure, and neglect the Tau term coming from the variation of rho, that's the decoupling of the trace Hamiltonian, and replace C tilde by C tilde average, and then make various choices for W. So if W is a canonical Q or P, you get the canonical algebra inside the average which I had on the last slide. If W is the Hamiltonian, the operator Hamiltonian, you get the Heisenberg equations of motion inside averages. And if W is a self-adjoint general generator G, you get the unitary canonical transformation properties of quantum field theory inside averages. And you can include sources in rho so that the average then has source terms that can be varied to generate things in a nice Schwingerian way. Okay, let me go on to the next slide. Now some remarks. The order lambda tilde term in the word identities vanishes. You don't have to assume that that drops out because I effective anti-commutator with, with a commutator of lambda tilde with any X is proportional to lambda tilde commuted with X effective, that's just algebra, and that's zero. The conditions for the neglect of the order Tau terms are more subtle. First of all, you need boson fermion balance. That again came from a paper I wrote with Akim Kent. It suffices for X dot effective and C tilde effective of disjoint supporting operator phase space, but that may not be the ideal uh, <coughs> condition for saying when these things are justified. Uh, the reason they need boson fermion balance, if, if you write QR, PR commuted average as I effective H star delta RS, and start putting it into sums with both bosons and fermions, the summation over commutators is 
I effective H bar, but then it's also if you have a sum, a sum over one, so it's the number of bosons. The sum over fermions is the number of fermions. And to get something that's just has no numbers in it, like C tilde average, you need roughly MB equals N of F. You need the rough, you need, you get a contradiction and that's basically the number of boson and fermion degrees of freedom are the same. Otherwise, these sums just don't match up with the assumed right-hand side. This isn't the same as full supersymmetry. It's uh, a weaker condition of boson fermion balance as opposed to the much more stringent conditions required to get a supersymmetric uh, quantum field theory in the West amino sense. Okay, next slide, please. Now, there are going to be Brownian motion corrections. See, what's appealing to me in this is that if we believe that quantum mechanics is only approximate and that there's some dynamics actually that gives state vector reduction, some of the measurement problems, solves the measurement problem, then you need a generalization of quantum field theory. And this has some nice features because in trace dynamics, whenever there's thermodynamics, there are going to be Brownian motion corrections to your averages. So C tilde will be I effective H bar plus some stuff that's rapidly fluctuating. And the model I make in my book is probably not the best one. I wrote a paper later giving another version. But without going through a lot of detail, if you make the appropriate ansatz for what's left over as a fluctuating part, you can make a connection to the mass proportional form of the continuous spontaneous localization. CSL stochastic Schrodinger equation. I call this GRWP Girard, Girardi, Rimini, Weber, and Pearl did the pioneering work on objective reduction. And I have plausibility arguments in the book, but not a derivation of CSL. That's going to depend eventually on having a proof of all the thermodynamic of all the thermodynamic average statements that I made before and a justification for the approximations made in deriving them. Okay, next slide, please. Now, let me just exhibit what the objective reduction models look like. This, as I say, can by hand waving be gotten from trace dynamics. It's a goal, but not something I can do rigorously. But then I give a long discussion in my book of uh, objective reduction models. So in the simplest form, if the leading small displacement approximation to both GRW and CSL takes this form, it's got a term minus I over H bar H psi, which is the usual Hamiltonian evolution of the Schrodinger equation in the Heisenberg dynamics. And then there are terms where there's a noise coupling that's on the far right, square root of eta Q minus average Q psi DWT, where DWT is a Brownian noise. And to preserve the normalization, you have a compensating term that's essentially the average of the square of that. Uh, because Q, the state, appears in the excretation and psi appears in the excretations, this is a nonlinear stochastic differential equation. And so the essence of the stochastic Schrodinger dynamics is nonlinearity without stochasticity isn't enough. Weinberg wrote some interesting, an interesting paper on nonlinear quantum mechanics, and it doesn't give the Born rule, and it also has superluminal communication. When you go to a nonlinear stochastic equation, it turns out that this equation has some nice properties. The one I just exhibited, that's from the Girardi remeeting Weber work and the Girardi remeeting Pearl papers. You can prove that this equation gives state vector reduction with the Born rule. So the Born rule here is a theorem and not a postulate. And you can rigorously prove that. A, a neat proof that's given in my book that builds on some work that Lane Houston did. There's also a proof of a different sort in the uh, Girardi Ramini Pearl paper. Uh, and two other things, I don't know if this is on the next slide or not. You can show that this form of the stochastic equation is unique if you put on two requirements. First, state vector normalization, which is the subtraction of the second term on the right, and also the requirement there should be no superluminal super communication when you average, when you average out the noise, the equation for the average density matrix should be linear 
and not permit superluminal communication. And those two requirements are enough to basically pin down the structure of the GRWP model. Okay, the next uh, slide, please. So it's summarizing trace dynamics as pre-quantum mechanics. Is a thermodynamics via equipartition theorems or ward which are ward identities. And you get a unitary evolution of quantum mechanics within the approximations and Heisenberg equations of motion and the Schrodinger equation when you go back from a Heisenberg picture to a Schrodinger picture. Then there will be Brownian motion corrections and that I conjecture gives you the CSL phenomenology which leads to the probability interpretation, the Born rule, and the reduction postulate of quantum theory theory then becomes a theorem in trace dynamics and not an extra postulate. Okay, next slide, please. So as a pictorial then, at a lower level, you have trace dynamics or generalized quantum dynamics. I quoted in my first paper with Andrew Millard with global unitary invariant dynamics. The variables are general matrices, no a priori commutativity properties are assumed. When you do thermodynamic averaging, you get quantum mechanics where the variables are special infinite matrices that obey the Heisenberg algebra. And then if you go to H bar to zero, you get classical mechanics where the variables are all commutative. So they're multiples of the unit matrix Going back by canonical quantization, you get from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, but in this picture, the quantum mechanics isn't foundational. But at, as a sort of offshoot, any sensible model, I believe, of state vector reduction should be, you should be able to write it in terms of your usual laboratory variables. And that's what the stochastic Schrodinger equations do, CSL and GRWP. They say that there's a manifestation of the underlying nonlinear dynamics in a nonlinear stochastic Schrodinger equation that obeys normalization and no faster luminal, no superluminal communication when you average. That comes from Brownian motion corrections to the trace dynamics because thermodynamics it involves averages and averages will always have fluctuation corrections. Okay, next slide. So that finishes the first part of my talk. Uh, after writing my Cambridge book, I didn't go on with trying to find an underlying theory. It just seemed to me too difficult. And most of my recent work has been inspired though, almost all of it. The one exception was I spent a couple of years writing numerical, numerical integration programs called PAMIR, which is a world scientific book, which are slow and haven't caught on, but they allow you to do integrals and localize arbitrarily in arbitrarily small regions for multiple integrals. It was something I always wanted to do, so I did it. But just about everything else I've done in the last 20 years has been an offshoot of the Cambridge book. So the first thing was I spent a lot of time on studies of the CSL model. In other words, the Girardi, Ramini, Weber, Pearl model of objective reduction. There are many papers between 2000 and 2021. Some highlights are with Larry Horwitz, we completed Houston's very neat Born rule proof. And that's in the book and in a paper I wrote with Larry. I studied bounds on CSL parameters from latent image formation. There was an old paper of Percival and Gizan saying that uh, obviously latent image formation is a measurement. And I thought, well, if it's a measurement, not many things move when you make a latent image. So that will require much larger, larger noise coupling than in the original GRW paper. So I wrote a, a rather long paper just doing a lot of back of the envelope calculations of saying based on Mott's theory of latent image formation and similar models for edge tractor, track detectors, how many atoms move, and then how big does the noise parameter have to be? And then what are the, that gives you some lower bounds in the noise parameter if latent image formation is actually to constitute a measurement and not say the ultimate development of your photographic plate or the etching of your etch track detector. 
And then there are upper bounds that come from geothermal heating, heating of the earth, and from uh, heating of the intergalactic medium. Now, the current, current experimental status is that the restrictions are very far below the upper bounds and are pushing my lower bound or maybe even ruling it out a bit. I don't take my lower lower bound, bound that seriously because if you look at the theories of latent image formation, they're very qualitative at best. So the lower end of my range is kind of nebishy. The upper end from intergalactic medium heating and from cooling of planets is much more solid. So I'm sort of happy that the bounds now are well below that because that would have been a problem. With Angelo Bassi, we wrote two papers developing CSL in detail for non-white noises because non-white noise, which is the original GRWP paper, is uh, papers, is an idealization and it requires no energy cutoff. So whenever you have finite energy, there's going to be a noise cut, uh, energy cutoff in the noise and therefore non-white noise. So that theory was worked out in some detail in the papers with Angelo. And then there are many other papers, a lot of them with Angelo and his group, group on CSL phenomenology. And we'll hear some talks, I think, from Angelo and Ulbricht later about the status of that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the second thing, in my book, I remark that there's an I sector, which I'm assuming is quantum theory, but there's also a minus I sector. Because I effective is a two by two real matrix representation of the imaginary unit. So it acts as I on one sector and minus I on the other. And if the sectors are uncoupled or only weakly coupled, the minus I sector could be the astrophysical dark matter. And I wrote only one paper on this. It's a gravitational essay that was published, you know, in, with many other honorable mentions in the gravitational essay competition. I still uh, hold out some hope for this idea. I mean, at the time it seemed a bit out on a limb because people were searching for heavy wimps and those searches have all turned out negative. Uh, I think people are beginning to wonder whether they're heavy wimps or whether it's maybe a lighter axion wimp, but whatever uh, axion, not, so not a wimp, the ax, whether it's an axion dark matter, but whatever it is, there's no real reason why it has to interact in a testable way with ordinary matter. So far, we see dark matter just through its gravitation. And so it could be a totally hidden sector that comes out of an underlying theory. So that's my conjecture coming out of trace dynamics is that the minus I sector is the dark matter. And there's some symmetry breaking that makes it have different properties from the I sector. Okay, that has to be developed a lot. Uh, next slide, please. Then I spent a couple of years working on unification models for the strong electroweak forces with boson fermion balance, but not full supersymmetry. In particular, I studied SU8 models with spin 3s particles. And, I, and this was somewhat inconclusive. The properties of, it led to a detailed study of the properties of gauge spin 3 halves and the associated anomalies. And it turns out that the original just pure gauge spin three halves has sicknesses that are long known and they lead to the fact that you can't calculate a perturbative anomaly. So when you directly couple the spin three halves to a spin one half, I found one model where you do get a perturbative anomaly. And then the accounting is actually different from that in the, all the old papers of Witten and Llewellyn Smith and Duff and so forth on the anomalies for spin three half series. So that actually led to me to have to change the particle conduct of the model. So I, that was where this led in the end. And it looks like you need quark lepton compositeness to get the standard model families. And I didn't really reach a definitive conclusion. I think we need experimental clues still as to what lies beyond the standard model of particle physics. It's been very frustrating. We don't know for sure whether it's a grand unified model of some type or whether it's a composite model, there are bounds of various sorts. If a composite scale were up at a few hundred TeV, we're not gonna be able to build an accelerator to uh, access it. So things can be very frustrating. So anyway, this I put aside because I didn't reach any compelling model for uh, unification this way. Next slide, please. 
Okay, the final thing that's actually led to most of my recent work is incorporating gravity into trace and dynamics. At a certain point, my wife said I was putting too much time into these numerical integration programs. She gave me a bit of a kick in the butt. So I decided, yeah, yeah that's right. And I get mad when I'm programming and the programs don't work. So I decided to go back and look at something that people had asked me about for a long time. What happens when you put gravity into the original trace dynamics formulation? So I just put in a classical metric and then started looking, following up in an old paper of Forger and Rumor on vial scaling and classical mechanics, which has natural analogs and trace dynamics. And it's easy to see the canonical ensemble has a vial scaling. That's a scaling under the metric goes to some scalar function of the coordinate times the metric itself. And that suggests that the non-derivative part of the induced gravitational action is also vial scaling invariant. So I proposed in the paper where I looked at this that there may be the, a possible cosmological quote constant action is minus lambda over a pi g, where lambda is what's observed experimentally, integral d4x, square root of the determinant of the metric, but not that by itself, which would be the usual dark energy action, but that divided by g naught naught squared because this is a, it gives you an integrand that's vial scaling invariant. So it's a departure from the idea that relativity is based on force-based general covariance, general coordinate invariance. I'm saying here that maybe the three plus one formulation of uh, relativity is really more fundamental. That's what's used for all numerical evolutions of black holes and black hole collisions. There's also, an offshoot of relativity called, called uh, shape dynamics that basically says the fundamental postulate should be the three plus one and not the four. And this fits naturally into that framework. So this is vial scaling invariant, but only three space general coordinate invariant. Now, the reason this is viable, I first thought, well, this is gonna be killed by cosmology, but in fact, the standard of model of cosmology, cosmology the, the Robertson Walker so dot 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 metric, G naught naught is one. So, therefore, you, this is indistinguishable to leading order and fluctuations from a true cosmological dark energy action. And therefore, in the spirit again of Steve Weinberg saying it's always good to have a foil against which to test your theories, this is a foil against which to test the idea that the cosmological constant is dark energy. So I made extensive studies of this over the last eight years. Uh, people raised the question, well, doesn't this action lead to scalar gravitational waves? And the answer is when you develop the perturbation theory for fluctuations around the standard cosmological metric, the answer is no. There's still enough residual gauge invariance from the three space general coordinate variance to show that you don't get scalar gravitational waves. It also leads to the idea that black holes may be horizonless because since there's a G naught naught to the minus two here, that prevents G naught naught from vanishing and therefore you don't get horizons. And I pursued that in a paper with Fethi Ramazanoglu where we put this action type of cosmological constant into the structure of black holes. No matter yet, just a matter free black holes but with this cosmological constant. And we showed that there's no horizon. Okay, next slide please. Now recently, what I've been doing is looking at another way of getting horizonless black holes, but by putting matter in and having the matter make a phase transition of a new sort. So the idea was there was there's a, a whole large literature going to Maser, back to Maser and Matola on gravistars and related objects from other people. But their gravistar idea was to have incorporate into a uh, black hole formation the possibility of an equation of state jump to what's called the Gleiner ground state where the pressure plus the density sum to zero or close to zero. And my thought was, well, if these things are real, they really are just relativistic stars. So you should be able to get the whole theory from solving the tolman oppenheimer volkov equations, TOV, with an equation of state jump. And based on some things that Fethi taught me about using Mathematica, I wrote a Mathematica program last summer to do this. 
Now, one of the things you find when you try to do this numerically and then just look at the equations, the TOV equations, is that the pressure can't have a dump because it's the same argument that says that the wave function in quantum mechanics and its first derivative have to be continuous if the potential is bounded. Same, and that, that gives you the junction equations and maximal equations. The pressure has to be continuous, but the density can jump. So in my model, what happens is as the pressure gets high enough, all of a sudden there's a jump to a state with a, a, ma of a matter with negative density. And that's in fact allowed, it's been known since the eighties that if you look at the quantum theory of, of uh, T naught naught, the energy momentum tensor, you cannot prove that T naught naught is positive anymore. This is noted in uh, Wald's book on relativity. So T naught naught can be negative in the quantum mechanical world and therefore having rho negative is totally allowed. So I do is I implement, implement the Gleiner equation of state by having rho plus P equals beta, which is a small positive constant. P must be continuous, but rho jumps to rho less than zero, which is allowed in quantum theories. And then programming this gives very nice gravis stars that have a interior structure, which is non-singular and a very quick transition to a exterior Schwarzschild-like solution but the radius at which the external Schwarzschild solution appears is not dialed in in advance as it is in the Matola Maser papers, but comes out dynamically. All that's pulled, put in, in advance is, a, is the pressure at which the equation of state jumps. And then the change in the structure of the exterior comes out dynamically and the radius where the change occurs comes out dynamically. So I've, I have then the mathematical notebooks for these Gravistars or exotic compact objects, they're called. And there's no horizon and no trap surfaces. Interestingly, the, <clears throat> they obey the null energy condition and the strong energy condition. Both of those are used to derive the Hawking and the Penrose singularity theorems. The reason there's no singularity is that those theorems require a trap surface to form to start. And here there are no trap surfaces. So I've written some papers on this, and then I also thought a bit about possible astrophysical implications of matter leaking out of gravity stars, because if there's no horizon, things that go in can also go out. There's one interesting experimental observation of a shredding of a star by a black hole and or a purported black hole. And then the stuff that burps out comes out two years later, which is very hard to understand in any conventional black hole picture because the uh, accretion disks are much closer than two light years. But it's understandable in a gravis star because the G naught naught becomes exponentially small in the interior of the gravis star, which means you can get very exponentially large time delays. So the burp could come much later. Okay, that finishes my talk. I made it short, so it's a lot of, there will be a lot of time for questions. What I'm doing uh, to do the next two years is basically continue working on the Gravistar stuff and also on my idea for a cosmological constant that's vial scaling invariant. And after I've answered some further questions on those, then maybe I'll go back to thinking about foundational things and what might be the underlying ontology for trace dynamics. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was very exciting and good to know about uh, trace dynamics overview and also uh, the more recent applications, including objective collapse models that you have been working on. So I'll open the talk up for questions now. As usual, kindly use the uh, uh, raise hand feature along with the, so uh, when you use, yeah, so here, this is Cole. Cole, let me please unmute you. Uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Oh, thank you, uh, first of all, for such a great talk. Um, oh, I, I can't, I can't hear. Um, anyway, I think, thank you for giving. Oh, I think, uh, I think uh, Professor Adler is muted. Yeah, I'm muted. Okay, now I'm unmuted. I, can you hear me now? 
I can, yes. Thank you. So okay. thank you very much for, for, for such a great talk. And uh, it, it, and also a, a very interesting research program. Uh, it's a very ambitious uh, project to take on to try to uh, reproduce QFT. Um, so I, I have a, a few questions, but um, I'll, I'll ask one right away because I think somebody else is already in line for another question. So my first question is, um, is it possible, could you... Um, uh, explain for us or or kind of summarize for us um, what are the if you were to take the the major uh, starting assumptions that we have in QFT um, and then the major uh, starting assumptions that you have in trace dynamics could you uh, kind of summarize for us what are the major uh, differences uh, between the two um, you know for example with in in I think you were saying that you you will not have a quantization procedure uh, in trace dynamics. Um, could, could you list out the, the major ones for us? Well, the major difference is in QFT, you assume a Heisenberg algebra. In, if that uh, index R in my Qs and Ps is a, a little box, so mm -hmm. R and S are distinct boxes, then commutator QR with QS and QFT is zero because spatially the Qs commute and the Ps commute. And commutator QR with PS is IH bar delta RS in quantum field theory. So that's the yeah. locality assumption of quantum field theory. In trace dynamics, that's totally gone. The Qs in different boxes don't commute. The Ps in different spatial boxes don't commute. And the Qs and Ps in different spatial boxes don't commute. And there's just no remnant of the Heisenberg algebra until you do a thermodynamic averaging. Okay. So the idea is that the Heisenberg algebra is emergent from thermodynamic averaging. Okay. Is this the is this the only kind of major uh, uh, assumptions uh, difference in assumptions in the beginning? Well, there, that's there, the biggest because or... I think one of the goodness quantum field theory books shows that starting from locality and rel relativity, you get the whole structure of quantum field theory. Relativity still has to be built in by hand into trace dynamics. Right. And that's in my book. I show that all these things are natural relativistic extensions, like C tilde is, relative, is a Lorentz invariant. Okay. Let me just get rid of this. Okay. C tilde is a Lorentz invariant. Here I can, I can unplug the phone. It doesn't have to be again. Over here. Uh, so. Relativity is put in by him, but the main difference is the total non-locality. And so then it's not such a mystery why there should be, uh, I have to unplug the other one. <laughs> one second. Peg, I'm on a Zoom. I can't, I can't talk now because I'm on a Zoom, okay? Okay. All right. Relative, sorry about that. I didn't unplug the phone. Okay. I have two phones and you're one it, of them. That's, that's, <laughs> that's real life. That's okay. It's real, real life. Uh, I'd say that's a major difference is that the assumption in trace dynamics is everything is underlyingly non local. Right. Because it may come from a mathematical structure where the different effect of variables don't commute until you average. And one would have to have some underlying mathematical structure with the natural dynamics. I've been intrigued by Hook's book on clock models and cellular automata. That's a one-dimensional model just circulating. And I, I spent some time trying to think of how to generalize that before I got back into, into Gravistars and wasn't able to, but I'm gonna go back to that. I think it's interesting. So, but in quantum field theory, the Heisenberg algebra is a very restrictive assumption about the commutativity properties of your variables. Right, yeah, and perhaps you, you get to quantum non-locality for free without, yeah. Okay, um, so there was there was somebody else that had a question before, but they seem to have uh, put their hand down. So I, I, I might no, take no, an no, opportunity. The question, the question's oh, there, the question. Oh, okay. Is there, okay, then I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go ahead. Okay, so that's a brief question, then you can continue. Uh, you talked about an observation about a star which was swallowed by well, a black hole uh, and where something came out of the so-called black hole. Do you have any reference for this? Uh, yeah, I do. Let me think, hold on. I have to just try to think of which paper I have it. 
because that's uh, interesting. If, so that if you search on Google for a black hole swallowed the star and it came out two years later, you will find it. Okay, then it, I will do this. Written, then, uh, written up extensively in the media, and a Google search will find it. Uh, hold on, let me talk. I can get my device and actually talk into it and get real reference. Basically, this would have been my question. Then uh, Nicole can continue. It's just, just, just curious because I've never yeah. heard about something like this. It's festival that way. But let me, one second, let me just log into my little device here. Black hole swallowed a star, and there was something coming out two years later. According to new scientists, a black hole devoured a star, and two years later released a belch of fire. Yeah, if, if you, there's a new scientist on the line, and you can access it by saying, astronomers. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And then, up on Google search. I will, yeah, I will ask Google. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay. I find you searching by using Google extremely valuable. If you hit the right key phrases, you can access an awful lot of stuff, I find. Okay, sorry then. Uh, I'm no, uh, no. happy now and thank you. Okay, okay. No, the, the group said that they were going to go back over historical data and see if there are other instances of this. And I haven't read anything yet being reported on that, whether there's other corroboration of this observation or other evidences of this. Yeah, uh, we could we we'll come back to you in a moment. Okay. Uh, Weiser, please, okay, Pia, sorry, please unmute yourself. Hi. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful seminars and okay. for a very interesting talk today by uh, the speaker. Um, and also Chloe had a very wonderful talk last time, so I'm waiting for the recording to be there. Uh, it's I, I don't have so much a question as much as something to uh, point to, to Professor uh, Adler. Uh, this is the scale variant vacuum paradigm. That's a paper that's uh, a research we were doing with Professor Andre Mader. And we are coming across uh, similar veil symmetry and the cosmological constants. So mm -hmm. you may find it useful and interesting to look at the, this paper and the related papers on the subject. Do you have an archive number for it? Um, I just posted the link to the MDPI. This is a free journal, uh, oh. Universe. It's in the chat, see if it's in the chat. Yeah. And I can Did post you... also the archive number uh, if I can quickly find it, yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Should, we, should we go on with the... Yeah, and uh, the, the question well, that I... kind of came to my mind okay, actually... So two, two. Let me write this down, one second. Mm -hmm. Hold on, <laughs> can I have the archive number back? I'd like to look at it. Two, oh, the, two, the archive number is 2202.08412. Yes. Twenty-two oh two point zero eight four one two. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. this is generally overview of what are the consequences of this idea of uh, scale variant vacuum uh, oh, related to well geometry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but oh, my question now is, uh, in your considerations, you actually were deriving the canonical relations uh, between the momentum and uh, the position coordinates, uh, but there wasn't anything about between momentum, momentum. Uh, yeah, no, the, yeah, it's the same thing. The Q and Q, R, Q, S is zero in average, and the P, R, P, S is zero in an average, and the Q with P is I, H, R, I, H, R, W, R, S. So the P, P and Q, P. The, the Q's in different boxes commute on average and the P's in different boxes commute on average. Mm -hmm. And it's only the Q for the same degree of freedom doesn't commute with the P for that degree of freedom. That all comes out of the structure of C tilde because C tilde is the sum of commutator QR with PR. The R's are the same indices in that commutator where the anti-commutator for fermions of QR with PR. And so that's why you get the canonical average from the structure of C tilde, basically. Right, but what, what about the commutators of the momentum? Well, the, linear, the piece. Well, as I said, 
uh, PR with PS is zero. That's the oh, standard. That, okay. So I see. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Back wouldn't to that be a problem not being able to reproduce then uh, typical things that the momentum has to be the covariant derivative and generally they don't commute uh, once you get to the covariant derivatives of the generalized momentum. Yeah, should they go on? It's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Well, well, just to go back to that, if you take, if, if you go to a minimal substitution where gradient is my, then that's, the P is the, uh, uh, but yeah, Steve, once you have uh, derived the average commutator, Q, P, cos H, but then the displacement operator would follow from yeah. there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think from the Heisenberg algebra, you get the commutators of things where you make a minimal substitution. I don't think there's going to be a problem there. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I would agree with you, yeah. yeah Cole? Yeah. Um, actually, just a, a quick comment. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, that uh, you generically you tend to get uh, models where the um, number of bosons is equal to the number of fermions. Um, and I did want to mention that there uh, there are uh, kind of possibilities um, out of the situation. And uh, uh, oddly enough, the octonions uh, offers one of those situations. Um, so when you're... Um, when you're looking at um, there, there, how do I say this? Um, when you look at the octonions multiplying themselves, they generate a Clifford algebra. And then from that mm -hmm. Clifford algebra, you can build something like a chirality projector or a, a projection operator that um, will be able to separate for you bosonic spaces from fermionic spaces. Mm -hmm. And when you use just one of those projectors, then you end up with a situation where you have the equal number of bosons to fermions. Um, so the bosons will end up on the on the diagonals and the fermions will be in the off diagonals. But um, with the octonions, you've got this kind of peculiar property where if you uh, write multiply um, by that same projection operator, it, it is re-expressible um, in terms of left multiplication. So to make a long story short, you end up with two uh, commuting projection operators. And what that does is it takes your, so you start off with this picture where you've got uh, two big diagonal blocks, which are your bosons, and then two big diagonal blocks, which are your, are your fermions, and there's an equal number of fermions and bosons. But what the second projector does is it takes those two big diagonal blocks and it shrinks them down into four smaller diagonal blocks. And so what you end up with is a situation where you've got the diagonals have now been shrunk. And so there's fewer bosons and there's more fermions on the off diagonals. And this is in fact, what the standard model has is more fermions than bosons. Um, so there, um, so it might be, and this seems to me to be a fairly generic uh, phenomenon, mathematical phenom phenomenon really. Um, if, if you were to find another uh, Z2 grading, um, uh, to split your bosons and fermions, if you use both of them to restrict the space of bosons down, then you might be able to get out of the situation where you have an equal number of bosons and fermions. Yeah, I, I guess I have no comment on that. I, at a foundation level, you could have equal numbers of bosons and fermions. At the level of what actually emerges as the low energy degrees of freedom, they could be very different because some things develop heavy masses and some things don't. Uh, you know, and I wasn't able to get a convincing argument from an NB equal NF uh, grand unified model for getting the current particle spectrum. It looked like it had the particles had to be composites so of the underlying in this SU8 model. Uh, I didn't see anything, a natural compelling way to get the current particle spectrum. Yeah. I guess my feeling about the current particle spectrum, to me, it seems like we're looking at the hyperfine structure of a very high energy system. And just like the hyperfine structure of various uh, atoms is complicated, these weird masses of the elementary particles strike me as basically hyperfine-like, and that we're not going to get simplicity at that level. 
Yeah, that's just. Uh, yeah, it's it's more just a comment that that it's um, there are there are ways out of the uh, the situation of having equal number of bosons to fermions. Uh, there are there are kind of fairly simple um, algebraic ways out of the situation. Basically, mm -hmm. just introducing a second a second z two grading as a, a second projector. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. <clears throat> Steve, I have a long list of questions for you, uh, 10 of them, but I'll intersperse, <laughs> I'll intersperse it with what the audience, uh, as soon as I see a raised hand, I will stop. Okay. So one thing which uh, would, you know, caught my attention was the origin of spin in quantum theory. What you have is a Lagrangian dynamics. Now in a Lagrangian dynamics, I would have expected spin angular momentum to be the canonical variable corresponding to some angle uh, because you are doing uh, essentially Newtonian dynamics with matrices. Have you had a thought on that? How would you get spin angular momentum in at the trace dynamics level? Uh, the answer I didn't think in detail about spin. Okay, okay. So uh, that was one of my motivations. I mean, spin, spin in quantum point. theory is simply having a multi component uh, wave function at, at one level. So the answer is no, I did not think in any detailed way about spin. Yeah, so There's an awful lot of topics I didn't address in the book. I addressed the, only a certain small number. Yeah, no, the book, the book is beautiful. Me and my students benefit from it all the time. So this is what led me on to higher dimensional spaces, you know, that uh, this, I, in trace dynamics, I would like spin to be the angular momentum corresponding to a variation of some angle, but that, that, that angle cannot be in space time because that would give me orbital angular momentum. So maybe there are extra dimensions uh, mm -hmm. to Space time, who's in which the angular variation is what uh, corresponds to spin. And that naturally led to a doubling of dimensions from four to eight and thereon to octonions. That's how I was motivated to mm -hmm. uh, studying octonions and their relevance in space time so that uh, you know I can try to understand spin from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my, 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 my second question is, um, so you are taking space-time as a given, as a Minkowski or a curved, but classical space-time. Uh, you mean that as an approximation? Because- Yeah, yeah no, I, I think that the, an underlying theory should, not, should lead to some splitting of underlying degrees of freedom into ones that correspond to metric and one that, ones that correspond to quantum degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And when I introduced gravity in the trace dynamics uh, uh, eight or nine years ago, it was just at the level of the classical background metric. Okay, okay. So this I is have no idea so far. I, I think the search for the fundamental ontology, to my mind, is a search for an ontology that leads to a very natural splitting of degrees of freedom and the ones that correspond to space and ones that correspond to quantum theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so here is what some of us are finding, that if you replace the space-time manifold R4 by a vector space, which is defined by the octonions, then that takes care of this kind of thing. What are the pre-space-time degrees of freedom which is in some sense consistent with the matrix nature of the trace dynamics degrees of freedom. At least uh, there seems to be some, uh, uh, I mean, you could, quaternions, quaternions are also good enough to begin with, but to, quaternions are good enough for electroweak and gravity. But if we need to bring in quarks and the strong interaction, we are compelled to go to, uh, space which is octonionic mm -hmm. i'm not okay. uh, i am no prejudice at the moment of what the underlying ontology is I, okay 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 there yeah. are many interesting possibilities yeah and then you 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 made another remark 
that we need new experiments to go beyond the standard model. I would have said we already have a lot of data, the 26 unexplained fundamental constants of the standard model, like mass ratios or fine structure constant. These, these are data. Whatever underlying ontology, we, what the, as you are suggesting, we develop must explain this data. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. And that's why I say the whole thing strikes me as a bit like the hyperfine structure of some very high energy system. Yeah. So yeah. it's not. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's very, yeah. Steve, I have one, one point of view difference with you on this. You know, when you say this is something about high energy, I think what is happening is that when you assume a background classical space time in trace dynamics, you're already assuming that there's a background classical universe with a lot of classical material bodies, which give rise to this space time geometry. But in principle, even the low energy universe need not have any classical bodies in it. And then I should still be able to do trace dynamics, but I no longer have space time, even at low energies. So I think the important underlying physics, the ontology is already there at low energies, at let's say LHC energies, but we are not seeing it because our universe is dominantly classical. In, yeah. principle, it, in principle, it need not be so. Well, my thoughts are a little different that the approximation of neglecting the Tor terms in the word identity is mm -hmm. similar to the statement that there's a big hierarchy in particle physics between the Planck scale and the scale of the observed particles. And I, uh, my hunch is that those are related facts or related yeah, facts. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree, but would, does tau mass have to be Planck scale? It could be any scale at which quantum field theory has not yet been tested. So yeah, just yeah, no, no, no. Tau doesn't have to be Planck scale, but it has to. My hunch is it is somewhere up in the neighborhood of the grand unification scale to the Planck scale. And that the decoupling in trace dynamics, if it's provable, will be related to the uh, hierarchy in particle physics. Yeah, so, you know, my, my, guess, my guess is that tau is the electroweak scale. And uh, well, that's, too, that's much too low. I think that's much too low. <laughs> Can you rule that out by current mm, data? I, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. My hunch is it's got to be a lot higher. Uh, okay, the okay. Maybe, maybe we is, should, yeah, we should talk about that. We should talk about that. Yes. Okay, great, great. And you know, you mentioned the dark sector coming from I going to minus I. I think I find that really fascinating and convincing. So in, in the octonionic approach, the dark sector is actually just a copy of the standard model SU3 color cross SU2L cross U and Y. The dark sector is SU3 grav cross SU2R cross U1 grav. And the SU2R is a precursor of general relativity. And I think we have a serious difference on MOND. I seem to get that U1 grav in the dark sector is actually the theoretical origin of MON. I agree it has problems with bullet cluster, but MON is a non-relativistic theory, good only on the galactic scales. Well, to but I, thought Mon, I thought Mon, the idea of MON is to totally replace the dark sector. You don't have a dark sector at all. You just modify Newtonian, the laws of relativity of small accelerations. So, yeah, but uh, I think I think relativistic MON is not the same as Milgram's MON. It, as just as Newtonian gravity is not the same as GR. Okay. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. But, but I like your dark sector idea very much. Uh, whether the dark sector implies dark matter particles, I'm not so sure. For me, the dark sector is actually, you know, the right-handed chiral fermions, which then acquire electric charge because of uh, non-standard model Higgs but uh, they are the source of gravity. So, yeah, anyway. Uh, so I think, uh, so, um, uh, so do you have a preferred cosmos or a frame of reference, Steve, in trace dynamics? Yes, 
Yes, in fact, that I should have mentioned a couple of the things coming out of trace dynamics feed into what I'm doing on cosmology and gravity stars. First, in trace dynamics, since <clears throat> the trace Hamiltonian picks the frame of reference because the Hamiltonian <clears throat> is not a, a Lorentz scalar. So that already suggested that it's acceptable to have a preferred frame. And that partly motivated my idea that maybe the so-called dark energy really is comes from a vile scaling invariant action which picks a preferred frame. Because trace dynamics requires you to pick a preferred frame. And the other thing is that I'm very skeptical of the idea that all these galactic cores are black holes, because that says that there is that's true. The universe has trillions of causally disconnected regions, whereas the mm -hmm. idea in trace dynamics is that everything is causally collect connected. Mm -hmm. So that's made me kind of suspicious of the fact that maybe they're not all standard mathematical black holes, but mm -hmm. some kind of uh, or relativistic, another species of relativistic star that obeys standard causality properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, that, that I found very interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, just checking if there are any questions. Uh, so there's a comment that there. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll I'll come back to the comments. I just my my my. Oh, yeah, I don't uh, want to get into a debate on mod because I'm not an expert in it, and uh, I uh, we'll see what experiment eventually says. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's a lot I, about physical data coming in the next few years. So my, my, my last question, Steve, we had to you probably know about the Popescu Rorlik bound in the CHSH inequality. Vaguely, vaguely, I read their papers, but it was so long ago and I haven't thought about it in a long time. Okay, so so what we found interestingly that in trace dynamics, when the charge C tilde is not equipartition. <laughs> The Sirilson bound in the CHSH inequality gets violated. The you, you know the no, cause, uh, relativistic causality allows non-local correlations stronger than quantum mechanics is allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so there, there's a gap. So, so quantum mechanics goes up to something like two root two, but relativistic causality allows to go up to four. So what we yeah. found is that trace dynamics it has stronger non-local correlations than quantum theory when the C tilde is not equipartition. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. And I, yeah. as I say, I've read about the PR. Uh, I read the PR paper, and I'm not following up on any of that. In the yeah, yeah. So why it seems very interesting is you know. When we switch on fluctuations to the average C tilde, C tilde average, uh, we could either have those fluctuations to be self-adjoint, that leads to classicality, but I could also have uh, anti-self-adjoint fluctuations to C tilde average, which is I effective H bar, and that is still not then that is still not quantum theory. I can mm -hmm. go away from equilibrium quantum theory in two ways either go towards classicality when my perturbation to the Hamiltonian is not self-adjoint or go away from quantum theory when my uh, there are additional perturbations to the Hamiltonian which are self-adjoint. And that is when the PR bound seems to be getting achieved. And I don't know, what is the physics there? Uh, uh, do you have some, what's the physics of trace dynamics when the fluctuations uh, to see till they are not self-adjoint. Again, I something I haven't really, uh, well, the fluctuations have to be anti-self-adjoint to give a GRWP type theory because GRWP assumes an anti-Hermitian noise coupling. Yeah, that, yes, yes. So that, so, and I discussed that in the book that you need anti-self-adjoint fluctuations Beyond that, I haven't thought, and I haven't thought about the PR bound at all. Right. Okay. Right. I'm, getting a little, I'm getting a little tired, so we should probably stop pretty soon. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So I'll admit only one last question. BHENS, please go ahead, and then we will stop. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question concerning your work on uh, more 
and uh, non-local correlations which are stronger than the one allowed in quantum theory. Do you have uh, any links to the uh, algebraic structure of your model? So, uh, me or Steve? Both of you, maybe who's able to answer this question. Yeah, it, it's just, it is trace dynamics. It is just trace dynamics, which is away from equilibrium. That seems to admit. Uh, okay, so, so why is this the case? I recall reading a paper that the algebraic structure of quantum theory also constrains the correlations. And if you want to have stronger correlations, you also need a more general kind of algebra. Yes, the right. algebra is trace dynamics. The, the commutators QP, are not IH bar. Not IH bar. So, so what I read in the paper, but maybe I don't know whether it was general, is that uh, if if your algebra of, of observables is non-distributive, then you can also violate the uh, serial and bound. Yeah, That's yeah, I think I, I remember your email, but I think as Steve said, he has not looked into the PR bound. I have no, I have no comment on that. I, I don't have not thought about the PR or serial and bounds at all. Okay, so it would, would be interesting to, to look at this to see what, yes. what maybe maybe you so have I something hidden in your structure. You have, yeah, that yes. would be, okay. Would be look, I, I would uh, like, like to thank Steve and for coming and joining us. Thanks so much for this beautiful lecture and for spending almost two hours with us. And uh, uh, that's about all. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you the next okay. talk two weeks from now. Lectures from people. Okay, thank you, Edgener. Bye bye. Thank yeah, you thank very you. much again, Steve. Thank you very much Thanks, indeed. Michael. Bye bye. Great. Bye bye. Right. Well, okay. thanks, Tajinder. Um, By the way, I'm sorry to learn that the uh, Coles talk from last week is not yet up on the site. I thought it was. I'll check. Unfortunately, um, Adrian's away until next Tuesday, but I'll chase okay. him to get it up on the site immediately he gets back. And also, of course, okay, okay, Steve. Great, great. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, apart from Coles talk, all the other talks are up. Uh, apart from Coles talk, all the others are up. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully we can get both uh, Coles and Steve's up um, on Tuesday or Wednesday. Right, right, great. So, right, uh, and looking forward, obviously, very much to the next session, which is, in yeah. fact, on the... Can you remind us when the next session is? Uh, so that should be 2nd June, John Barrett. Right, yes. On, yes, the 2nd uh, June. On commutative yes. geometry. Yes. So I'm if uh, anyone in the audience has any comments or questions, we can discuss for some time. Or we can say bye, whatever you feel. Uh, so BHENS, you are burnt. No, we have corresponded, I think, right? Oh, I should unmute you. Sorry, sorry. Please, yes. Yes, we have corresponded. Yeah, well. yeah. Thank you. Now I remember your email about the Cyril's and yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, yes. For me, it would be interesting to know whether. Um, it goes in both directions. So whether distributivity leads to uh, the sales and bound or whether uh, this is just one mark which you can use to, to uh, limit this or whether there are other structures which are still linear distributive but which still violate the bound. This would be something which yeah. would be of interest yeah, to me. Good point. I have so unfortunately not returned back to that paper. I got caught with other things, but uh, your point is good. And uh, Steve said he's also, I would have liked PR to look at uh, trace dynamics, but uh, I wrote to them, but uh, there was no response. I think trace dynamics, in my opinion, is very fundamental. It is what underlies quantum theory. So looking at these non-local correlations in trace dynamics is very is very relevant, I feel. Yeah, well, so, so, so what I wanted to say was hidden sometimes, um, some of these nonlinear structures uh, have also representations by matrices, so which is something which is quite linear. Uh, and so it could be that you're working with a representation of a very nonlinear structure, uh, and mm. you don't know that you're working with this representation. And for example, one of the first examples where people tried to delinearize quantum theory was with certain near fields, which can be re represented by skew Hermitian matrices. So by anti-Hermitian mm -hmm. matrices, and um, maybe it's hidden in the formalism. That's what I wanted to say. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So, but so that formalism is uh, trace dynamics. 
in my for, from yeah, my yeah I, I, I don't doubt that it will be trace dynamics the question is maybe trace dynamics is hidden some uh non-linear structure uh, uh okay i now understand so yeah so i think the non-linearity probably comes if you if you if the dynamics is non-unitary but non-preserving you are led to non-linearity so that maybe ties up with what uh, so I have a paper on the, on quantum just a few days back. So asking, uh, so when trace dynamics is being modified away from equilibrium by adding stochastic non-unitary terms. Okay. So we, we break this up into two parts. What is the role of non-unitarity? And what is the role of stochasticity? I don't want to switch them on both simultaneously but one by one. So we found that non-unitarity, assuming norm preservation despite non-unitarity, will lead to a non-linearity which would break superposition. Now, if I do a coarse graining, that is I don't observe at the precise resolution at which the dynamics mm -hmm. was defined, the coarse graining gives rise to stochasticity and randomness of outcomes. So, so, so basically, at a fundamental level, you have a deterministic non-unitary evolution. Yes, it's only yes, because absolutely. by coarse graining, you like you have in a statistical mechanic, for example, yes, I cannot absolutely. trace every air molecule, uh, but right. the equations of motion for uh, air molecules are deterministic. It's only because yes. there are so many degrees because of freedom uh, that, that I have to trace. With, with, the, with the difference that there is non-unitarity. Okay. Non Mechanics is deterministic and unitary, but here it is deterministic and non-unitary. Non okay, so you exchange uh, unitarity for uh, and determ and non-determinism for uh, non-unitarity and determinism at uh... yes, yes, yes. Ah, yes. okay, and but the non uh, further recall the non-unitarity non is at the fundamental level my fundamental hamiltonian is not unitary mm -hmm. i don't see any reason why i say at the Planck scale the hamiltonian have to be unitary i see and it's unitary in the emergent approximation in which steve gets quantum theory kind of, okay it, okay yeah of course then it has to be unitary to, but you get the correct limit, so the anti-unitarities wash out at a large scale. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and isn't there a problem with having non-linearities and determinism because of the strong non-local effects, or does the anti-unitarity... The underlying, the underlying theory, uh, since we have not tested it by experiments, you can have deterministic uh, non-linearity could give you superluminal signaling, but after coarse graining, it should not. The coarse grain theory should not allow superluminal signaling because the coarse grain theory is like what we see in but, today. But if I would have access to the Planck scale, could I then uh, transmit signals? Yes. Super I think I think that is consistent to my understanding with what Steve is saying that uh, trace dynamics is truly non-local and okay, only, so, the, so. only the emergent theory is local. So non-local in the strong sense. So if I yes, yes, switch yes. my fingers here, I can touch you immediately. Yes. Despite the fact that there's a lot of room, uh, the space between me and you at the moment, but this would not happen on the fundamental level, then everything would be connected to each other. Yeah, yeah that's what he was also saying, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so I could send you, a def uh, well, it, the first paper was written in German, but the matrices, so the representation matrices, the, they don't depend on the language. So I could send you the first paper on ideas to go beyond linear quantum theory, and uh, this paper also gives the representation of a certain mathem mathematical structure uh, as a skew Hermitian, uh, basically uh, it's, it's, it's written in real ma matrix form, but uh, you can also move it into uh, the complex case then. And maybe you, you, the matrices you see there uh, might look familiar to you or not, but it, it would be interesting to see whether the, this- yeah. the well, let's, let's, try, let's try to cast it in the trace dynamics language because uh, 
I, yeah. I think that's quite versatile and yeah. Okay, so, so, so you have a certain uh, nonlinear structure which can be re but which has the representation by matrices. So you can work with you can represent the elements of your nonlinear structure by by a certain yeah matrices which are well Schuhermitian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and the question is whether uh, if you just work with your matrices, so so the nonlinearities uh, is then hidden in the kind of representation. So okay, uh, I see. Maybe you could send me some literature. Literature and uh, maybe then there's a link or maybe there's no link, but it, it would be interesting because yeah. you, you say that you rarely to serials and bound. And I would like to know whether, uh, yeah, what kind of algebraic systems do follow the serials and bound and which do not follow. Yeah, so, so my, at least naively, my understanding is uh, systems which do not obey the Heisenberg algebra, cubic commutator equals IH bar, while oh, okay. it. Okay, then there would be, of in, course, in many the, possibilities. In the proof of the CHSH inequality, we use the Heisenberg algebra. Ah, okay. So if you want, okay, then if you violate this, then you uh, also violate yeah, the proof. In, get, okay. in getting the serials and bound from CHSH, we use the Heisenberg. Algebra. Okay, I say, okay. It's so then if you violate the Heisenberg relation. It's a very interesting question experimentally to search for violation of the serials and bound. I think uh, maybe it happens at high energies. If I do a Bell experiment with beyond the TV scale with very high energy particles. Okay, this is going to be very difficult, I would say. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Michael, should we wind up? Are you there? Uh, yes, I'm still here and I'm very great, grateful I was able to stay for the Q&A. Um, if I could just come in very, very quickly indeed on the last point, as you, I'm sure you know, the Cyrilson bound is uh, very intimately related to the Grotendieck inequality. And, oh, I didn't um, know this, I didn't know this. Oh, oh yes. Uh, indeed, oh. uh, it it, it oh. actually follows directly from the Grotendieck inequality, and okay. therefore, and there is there is a there is a quite large. It's very ironic because the the, the seminar that I'm just about to transfer over into is is a, is a kind of category categorical algebra uh, seminar, and I think the next speaker but one is actually going to be talking a little bit about this about um, uh, some of the algebraic properties of the Cyrilson bound in the uh, in the context of Grotendieck's work on algebraic geometry, or rather, actually, his work on functional analysis. Which is in fact where he he identified the Grotendieck inequality. It comes from his work. So the Serelson bound and, is sacred. Then it, it it cannot be violated. Uh, no, 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 no. That's not the suggestion at all. It's just that it. Um, but it is expressive of this particular algebraic condition, um, which which has which has a very interesting that. meaning from the point of view of 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 the behaviour of. Um, uh, of bounded and unbounded operators in functional analysis. Uh, ah, okay. Very, yeah, very yeah. Um, and the, there is I quite substantial that. literature on this, but it's very, very much a pure mathematics literature. And the interesting thing is that only very recently have some people, there's a guy in France, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but he he he, he works at the Institute uh, IHP, the Institute des Autitudes Scientifiques, the IHS, IHS, I should say, outside mm. Paris, who... Um, uh, who has been trying to connect up via um, some ideas to do with algebraic K theory, possible significance from the point of view of, of, of um, what you might call the, you know, the very algebraic end of, of mathematical physics to do with the behavior of, mm -hmm. of algebras in you know, algebraic structures in phase space. Um, what the consequences of this um, possible violation of the Cyrils and Bound might be. Um, it's, it's very interesting because, of course, Grotendieck expressed the desire that none of his work would ever get into physics. <laughs> but it turns out <laughs> it's uh, ten years after his death. It is beginning to leach into some of the more abstract um, issues to, to which we've been discussing today. But whether there's a connection with trace dynamics, I'm absolutely not qualified to say. But, but, but this has been. A, I can send you a reference for the uh, some of the papers here. Yeah, on the, yeah this uh, is, this would be great. Remark by David Chester. Unfortunately, there was not time enough to take it because Steve had to leave for some connection between trace dynamics and octonions. Uh, so maybe I'll just leave it like that. Uh, or I can read it out, uh, Michael, so that stays in that uh, sure, recording. Read it out. Is it in the yeah. chat already? Is it in the... 
Okay. This is in the chat here. Yeah. David yeah. has okay. left, but he has a question. Could could trace dynamics be used with octonions or split octonions for E8 via O cross J3O? Following recent mathematical results from Wilson, Ray, and Manog, Adler mentioned E8 for three generations around 2002 to 2004. Using spin 44, spinners can encode three on shell generations. I wish that time to take this up, uh, but at least it's, it's there in the is there in the recording, so it's, it's, it will it's stay. In the track, yes, that's a very yeah. interesting question. Well, look, yeah. thank you again for a fascinating. Well, thanks to Steve. I know he's gone now, but uh, and thanks to all the people who participated in the Q and A. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was once again, I think, a very, very rich and interesting afternoon or morning, yeah, depending okay. on whereabouts so, in the world you're following it from. I have just one final remark concerning the yeah, sure. bullet cluster. Some of the Mount people uh, seem to uh, imply that I have now fa uh, found a way around this, so I cannot yeah, yeah, yeah. pay for yeah, uh, To my understanding, the bullet cluster is not a outrageously serious problem for Mon. Milgram says the Mon doesn't work well for clusters, and that was always known. He actually said, what's so special about the bullet cluster? And the, what he says, you need some bit of extra uh, dark matter, which could be dark baryons, or it could be mm. a sterile neutrino. He doesn't rule that out. So my, think... my, my bigger picture is that Maybe on cluster scales, Mond is not the same as the Mond on galactic scales. Hmm. This could be true. Uh, after all, we don't have a relativistic version of Mond at the moment. So, so it's, it's, it's there, there is, of... as I was mentioning at the beginning of, uh, you know, just before Steve started to talk, that there is a there is a big meeting to mark the 40th anniversary of Mond coming up uh, in about uh, uh, 10 days time now at St Andrews in Scotland, which um, I'm, I'm hoping we're, we're, we're discussing it with them at the moment, uh, that we may be permitted so, to record uh, the archive, which we would be, of course, very happy great. to put Milgram on. Milgram will come. Milgram is coming. Milgram, Milgram is indeed giving the, Milgram is indeed the chief invited speaker. Um, great. But there's, there's quite an impressive I'm, I'm line. So, I'm so glad there's a meeting. I, I'm all for more, and I don't see any dark matter coming. Well, I'm very intrigued by Mon, partly, of course, because it gives it very much the same uh, underlying approach as the one which um, our friend Igor Konachikov is approaching with his pre-canonical, -pre uh, and you know, pre-canonical quantization as ansatz, um, which again suggests an alternative explanation for the. No, for, for for the dark matter, so, but Ooh. still, um, I, I shall be very interested to hear if if I'm able to attend. I, I, at the moment, I'm still not clear, sure whether I'll be able to go up there or not. But if I can, I, I certainly will, and um, I look yeah. forward to reporting yeah. back. If, yeah, if there's an entire conference and more, it means a lot of people are taking it seriously. Yeah, if, yeah. You, if you have a conference, normally more people. <laughs> No, it's yeah. it's quite a big lineup. It's, uh, so cool. it's and I'm afraid it's sold out at the moment. Uh, if you just Google 40 years of Mon St Andrews, oh, Scotland, you'll get the entire love. you'll get the entire uh, program. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I'll I'll do that. Thanks for telling. Yeah, me thank you. That. Very interesting. And also the okay. growth in inequality. These are yes, I, also, I can send you some of the references on that as well too. And this has been a fascinating afternoon. Uh, so thank you again, everybody. Can you send it to me as well? Of course, uh, I'll simply send it. To, well, I'll send it to Jinder, and he can he can pass I'll it. Yeah. it burnt, I'll yeah, don't, be, it. don't be great. I would yeah. thank you for yeah. this. Yeah. Also, I must apologise, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to to go now uh, because yeah, I've got this other meeting to attend. Let's close up. Yes, yeah, yeah. Bye. Is that okay? Bye. Right. Thank you again, Bye. everybody. Bye. Great. Bye. We'll see you on the second agenda. But yeah, see you on the second. Be in touch second. before that to make sure that we've got everything up to date on up great. to date on the um on on the um. Uh, on the channel, on the YouTube channel. Thank you. Okay. okay. All the best. Cheerio. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Best to everyone.